On today's show, hunting dogs define the new cool. Find out what all the hype is all about. You know, they're very personable dogs, all of them. We take a special walk in Minnesota's big woods. So it's a great place to just really relax. Bit of cheese we got. Plus, an Italian dish cooked right over the campfire. That looks pretty darn good. Perfect. Wow, not too shabby. Minnesota Bound, presented by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Well, the snowy season is suddenly upon us. It sure is nice to be indoors next to the fire today. And it feels good. Hot to Trot has a new meaning with a rare hunting dog breed. Yeah, you know, it turns out that versatile hunting dogs are the new in. <laughs> When it comes to choosing a breed of dog to be your hunting companion, most everyone has a strong opinion, and some can't choose just one. Generally, I have six to eight different breeds of dogs here. Hey, Z. Yeah, Z dog. Hey, Spice. What do you think? Good boy. Ed Erickson, owner of Autumn Breeze Kennels, is not only a hunting dog enthusiast, He's also a dog trainer who specializes in the versatile hunting dog. I trained my first Brocco Italiano 20 years ago. There was like 40 of them in the United States. Today, five to 600. They're definitely a laid back dog. They have a different style. The Brocco Italiano is known for its famous trot. They call it a Braga. They have probably the best nose of any of the bird dogs I've trained. They're phenomenal with their nose. A great nose is a plus, but what makes the Bracco Italiano so versatile? Versatile bird dog is a dog that'll hunt land and water, track wounded game, and track big game blood track if trained to do that. So they're a versatile dog. The Bracco has a slight bloodhound appearance, yet is full of pointing and hunting history. The Bracco Italiano first recognized about 700 AD, and uh, it was originally a netting dog before firearms or using bows. Then he hunt them up. What they would do is they'd uh, get cubbies of birds and they'd push them into a, an area, and then they'd stop and they'd point so a person could throw the net over the birds or over the game to catch it and retrieve it. Benny, here, good boy. There are 30 different breeds that are recognized as versatile hunting dogs. Another is the large Munsterlander. It's a German breed. The breed was actually discovered in 1919 in Munster, Germany. This year we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the breed. It came to the United States in uh, 1961. You still may be wondering what all the hype is about. I've always said, you know, use a well-trained dog, preserve game. So a lot of people ain't good shots. These dogs are good at finding the cripples. If you're a pointer owner, you may relate to this. I don't get wet feet. I tell everybody. I have a lot of clients that come and say, well, I don't need to worry about water work. I don't duck hunt. Well, I say, have you ever shot a pheasant going across a pond? I've done that. So my dog will go in there and search, and I don't have to throw rocks or any of that. They're going to find the bird. Conservation of game is key, but the versatile hunting dog enthusiast also wants to preserve the breed. You're at a Minnesota Versatile Hunting Dog Federation evaluation. This is an outstanding tool for gun dog breeders gun dog breed clubs, individual hunters, as a one-stop shop to evaluate all the characteristics of a versatile hunting dog. And this is a way to accelerate the process of making sure that you have a well-trained dog and a highly talented dog. And that's why we use the Versatile Hunting Dog Federation 
to evaluate our dogs and improve their hunting capabilities. Versatile as a hunting dog or home companion. Either way, they always become family. They want to please. They'll come up and lick my mustache. And, you know, they're very personable dogs, all of them. You know, I've trained 24 different breeds of pointing dogs, and they've all got a special place. Coming up, we take a walk in the park. This one is known for its very big woods. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Connecticut. Rapala, Star Bank, and by Ice Castle Fish Houses. Up next, it's time to take a walk in the big woods, a very Northwoods-like atmosphere in the southern part of our state. Nurse Strand Big Woods State Park was established in 1945. The name Big Woods is a reference to this large forested area that European settlers encountered as they arrived here in the 1850s. Uh, that forest was made up of things like maples, basswoods, oaks, and elm trees. And those uh, settlers quickly realized the value of the natural resources here. So they established a series of family woodlots that persisted here until about the 1930s. That's when people started to recognize that there were threats to this location in the form of logging companies starting to size up these trees. They decided that it was important to try to fight to establish this as a state park. This park has a wide variety of activities for people to participate. In the springtime, this is a great park for checking out those early wildflowers that carpet the landscape here. In the summertime, we, of course, can check out Hidden Falls. Hike around 11 miles of trails. And in the fall, of course, uh, right now you're seeing the amazing fall colors that we get here. The diverse mix of trees here at the park provides us with brilliant reds, yellows, and oranges. Camping is a very popular activity out here at the park. Uh, most weekends, uh, we're pretty fully booked up. A lot of people just getting out to do things like bird watching, hike the trails. So it's a great place to just really relax. If you have a park you want us to highlight, message us on Facebook and tell us your favorite location and why you like it. We'll add it to our list. 
Still ahead, cooking over campfire coals. This dish is all about amore. Closed captioning brought to you by North Dakota Tourism. Everybody, Chef Jim Kimberg from Crave Restaurants and I are getting wild in the outdoor kitchen today. And Chef Jim, we are cooking over the campfire. What are we making? We're making venison lasagna today. Ooh, that sounds good. Perfect for a hot meal after a long day in the woods. Definitely. Well, it looks like our coals are ready. What are the first steps to getting the recipe going? We're going to brown up some ground venison. Ooh, all right. Skillet? Skillet. Bring it on. First would be uh, venison. Oh, there we go. Time for the good stuff. Whoa, there we go. How's that? <laughs> good job. All right, next we're going to season it up with a little salt, pepper. Salt and pepper. Italian herbs, let's do it. Fresh is best. All right, it's time for the sauce. Cover it. There we go. That looks perfect. Delicious. Then we'll set it aside and we can start building our lasagna. So we're going to set this kind of right next to the coals. Touch of olive oil. Now we want a nice base layer of sauce to put those noodles in. And here's a quick tip for you. You can bring along no boil lasagna noodles, or you can pre-boil your noodles and bring them along with you, like we did. Time to layer it up. A good half inch. I think we're ready for some spinach. Always good to add some greens. I always think this is a great way to get your kids to eat vegetables, too. <laughs> Hide it Hide in the it. meat. <laughs> Got a sprinkle of cheese. How about a handful? A generous handful. <laughs> We're going to repeat the noodles. Last layer of noodles. Layer of noodles. All right, let's top it with the last bit of cheese we got. All right, we're going to put the lid on it. Now it's time to cook it up. It is. So we got to uh, figure out how many coals we got to put on top and how many coals we have underneath. So it looks like we need 18 on top and six on the bottom. One of the most common mistakes is having too much heat on the bottom, so that'll cook faster than the top, and you end up with that crunchy bottom. We're just okay. gonna place that right over the center of those coals. It's gonna take a lot of muscle power right now. Good. See how much you've been working out. Oh. oh yeah, you've been hitting the gym. That's right. Now it's set it and forget it. Set it and forget it, about how much time? Uh, I'm guessing at least an hour. My stomach is telling me it's been about an hour. I'm hungry. How about you? I'm starting to smell it. It smells pretty good. <laughs> Should we take a look? Let's take a little look here. A little blessing. Let's see what we got. Woo! Look at that. It looks pretty darn good. Perfect. Wow. Not too shabby. Mm-mm-mm. Venison lasagna. Dutch oven campfire cooking. Gourmet in style, yet oh so easy. And delicious. Very delicious. I'm hungry. Wildly delicious. It's really good. Straight ahead, Ron Shera's favorite duck hunting moment, straight from the blind. Minnesota Bound, brought to you by Minnesota DNR. Radco Truck Accessories. Bent Creek Golf Club, Eden Prairie and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Today's Minnesota Bound Classic takes Ron Shera way back in time. Back to a few of his favorite days in a duck blind. When autumn comes and the chill winds blow, their faces turn toward the sky. Their hearts head for the duck marshes and goose fields. They are waterfowlers. Waterfowlers who find something special out there, romping in the marsh muck amid splashing decoys and anxious dogs with a menagerie of birds on the wing. Whatever that special feeling is, it knows no boundaries. Former Boston Celtics star Kevin McHale 
founded a long time ago. This is my favorite hunting of all. If I had to only hunt one thing, it'd be duck. <laughs> Kevin, the conservationist. Kevin, yeah. It's easier for these ducks to score on him off his right side. I can see that already. In the autumn of 99, the waterfowl forecast is upbeat. Record goose numbers and more than 100 million ducks in America's flyways. It's the kind of news that Don the Duck Man, Helmick, lives for. See, it's the type of nut that comes out. <laughs> <laughs> and passing it on to a son or a daughter. It reminds me of when I was his age, and now I see it through his eyes. And it, and it gets me all fired up again. A few seasons back, Don Helmick introduced his son Mike to his passion. You know, this was my 410 when I was your age, Mike. This is 37 years old. I was hunting when I was his age, and time that I spent with, with my dad was real special. And until my dad died, we always shared a love of waterfowling. And I'm just real happy to be able to pass it on to Mike. I know the feeling. It was a special duck season for me when my daughter Simone agreed to come along. <laughs> come some over there. Oh, still, oh, still. Okay, there you go. I missed. You missed. <laughs> no bird, Raven, no bird. Still going, <laughs> like the Energizer Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> huh. The ducks don't have much to worry about over here. <laughs> On this day, the ducks were scarce, but Raven didn't mind, and daughter Simone didn't either. Raven fetched one duck, and that was enough. Good girl. For some waterfowlers, the birds become a way of life. Jim Cook is like that. He's a duck hunter who spends his spare time collecting old decoys. Well, this is a feeding mallard from Illinois, and here they also even carved the corn in the old days. So that's a corn cob they throw out there with the decoys in hopes that that would be an additional lure to the ducks. Cook's collection is worth more than a million dollars now which means there's a price and a story behind every decoy. This decoy is a pintail decoy, and it was made by John R. Wells in Toronto, and he made this decoy for the future king of England, and he had come to Canada to hunt the Delta Marsh in Manitoba, and he had a sack of these decoys made. So this was hunted over by the king and his party. <laughs> but the real story of waterfowling is out there amid the cattails, out there when the sun rises, when the marsh hawk flies, when the killdeer flitter over the mud flats. And most of all, it's being there with waterfowl, when their calls from on high signal a change in the seasons as old as time. <laughs> Such great stories from the fall marsh. That's right. Speaking of stories, don't forget the Minnesota Bound podcast, the stories behind the stories, where we get to sit down and talk a little more in depth about our favorite tales. You can find the Minnesota Bound podcast anywhere you choose to listen to podcasts. Well, that about does it for us this week. Until next week, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. To get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook.